we doing, everybody? And welcome in to Wisconsin Sports on the Go with Trage. I'm your host, Trage. It is Thursday. A fantastic Thursday. A fantastic June 20th here in the great state of Wisconsin or wherever you're listening from. Illinois, Indiana, wherever it is. I'm uh, Hopefully, it is a fantastic day just as well there. I mean, they're talking about rain again. We can't get away from it. But outside of that, we're going to make it. A great day. That's what we're going to do, right? We're going to make it a great day. That's what we have to tell ourselves every single day, even if it's raining. We got to make it a great day. So great day to talk about some sports here. I got lots I want to get into. I want to tap into just about everything today, from the Bucks to the Packers to the Brewers. I got it all. A little bit of elsewhere in the league right now. A little bit of everything. A little bit of everything here. So right away, I want to look at something that I was hearing yesterday, and that is... Who is your baseball greatest of all time? And, you know, this this one really, you know, when I I had to really think about this. I had to, I, I sat there and I was like, man, you know, who would I rank as my top player of all time? I mean, you got... There's there's a bowl load of players you can go with, right? You got Babe Ruth. I mean, if if you're a big Babe Ruth fan, there, I mean, you have Hank Aaron has got to be up there. You're talking about guys like Willie Mays, who's up there. Ted Williams. I mean, Ty Cobb is up there. Lou Gehrig. I mean, there have been Mickey Mantle. You can't forget about Mickey, right? There are so many guys up, you know, that have played either in, you know, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, whatever it was. And they have paved the way from what we're seeing today, but the numbers that they put up while doing it, ridiculous, ridiculous. So, I mean, just looking at them, it's like, who do you rank, right? And, you know, if you you guys out there, I would love to hear what you guys think. I'm going to post it out there on the Facebook page. I'm going to ask out there who's the greatest player of all time. I'm also going to, uh, you know, if you have, if you have an answer to this, shoot it out there in the fan mail. Uh, if you go into the description of this show, of the show here, you can go into the bio there and you can send a message, right? And shoot it to me. Let me know who you think is the greatest of all time in the MLB. Because I'm going to shoot it out there to people on Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is, and see what people think too. I want to know. I want to know from the public what you guys think. Because this one, this one threw me for a loop. But when I think of the greatest of all time. It's hard not to say Hammer and Hank, Aaron, right? It's hard. It's hard not to say Hammer and Hank. I mean, you're talking about a guy who ended his career with a 305 average, 755 home runs, 2,297 RBIs, 3,771 hits, and I mean, he played right field, right? Didn't really play that long of a career uh, I believe it was for him. Mean, he got the Negro League, right? 1951. But then he played until 1976 there. But all in the NL, always playing every day. You know, maybe if you flip him and you put him in the DH role in the AL, maybe that changes, right? His longevity, his ability to stay out there and everything like that, and his ability to hit. Because, I mean, that guy was hitting home runs from day one until the end there. And it has been crazy to watch him there. I mean, you know, now the home run was beat by Barry Bonds, but do we, is that, do we, I don't want to say, you know, because there might be some Barry Bonds fans out there that we're just going to take away his record. But at the same time, it's like, Hammer and Hank was it. He was that dude. He was that dude. And, you know, that's not to take anything away from Willie Mays. I mean, Willie Mays, 301 average, 660 home runs, 1,909 RBIs, above 3,000 hits there. I mean, Willie Mays was fantastic also. And, I mean, Babe Ruth, pitch, and uh, he was a pitcher and a hitter there, and very good numbers on both sides there. I would just say if I had to pick my... And I mean, you got Griffey, you got Griffey Juniors in there. I mean, it's it that is it's a difficult question. It is definitely a difficult question. But I would definitely have to say, and as I'm recording here, I just watched Freddie Peralta throw that thing into center field. Had him picked off, threw it into center field. But getting off topic there, I would just have to say Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron would be my greatest of all time. 
Now that's not to say that, you know, somebody might say, well, you know, this stat tells me this and stat, this stat tells me that I just, you know, from what I've read about Hank, seen a little bit of video, right. And everything that I've read up on him and looking at the stats and everything, he was one heck of a ball player and it was all through his career. And the home run ball, I mean, he was ridiculous with the home run. But it was just ridiculous to watch this guy and to see the stat lines, to see him over the years, how he progressed, everything like that. So, I mean, to me, I would have Hammer and Hank Aaron. But I'm going to shoot the question out there, and it's going to be out on the Facebook page. It's going to be out on Twitter, uh, everywhere that I can get the question out there. And I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask people, and I want to see, you know, who the majority, if there is a majority that says one guy or what everybody's thinking there. So with that, I mean, that's where I wanted to start was the greatest of all time. I know yesterday we talked a little bit about, you know, Willie Mays and the career that he had and the, you know, sad, sad day that when he passed away there, but that kind of sparked my interest of, you know, cause Willie Mays is up there as one of the greatest baseball players of all time. So I really wanted to get into that and just, kind of see where I was and then kind of hear where you guys are at with your greatest of all time. Even better question, who's the greatest brewer of all time? Who is the greatest brewer of all time? That's a toughie. That's a tough. If I'm going with my favorite brewer of all time versus my greatest of all time, two different spectrums, right? Because Ryan Braun's my favorite brewer of all time. But, you know, you get over to who was the greatest brewer of all time. That's... <sighs> That's tough. That's tough. I mean, you got you got guys who Robin Yount, Paul Molitor, Cecil Cooper. Uh, you could, I mean, Prince Fielder had some good years with the Brewers there. If you went bullpen, Trevor Hoffman was fantastic. Raleigh Fingers was fantastic. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you could go with greatest Brewer of all time. Maybe I'll double dip. I'll double dip. I'll ask people what they're thinking about the greatest player of all time and who the greatest brewer is of all time i'll double dip on that question there and then tomorrow i'm going to come back with my answer of who the greatest brewer of all time is there so with that getting off of the greatest of all time talk the goat talk and everything like that we all know the nba goats michael jordan come on we all know it we all know it six and all all those nvps all those defensive players you can't you can't dethrone that guy I mean, Michael Jordan is the GOAT of the NBA. That's undeniable. But sticking with the here and now, we have a little bit of a rivalry starting up between the Yankees and Orioles, a little bit more than there was before, right? So a little bit of backstory. We watched yesterday there when I said Judge got hit in the hand. We talked about Judge's injury. And there was another, I believe, Glaber Torres was hit by a pitch too. So two guys get hit last night, or yet two days ago there. And now last night, we watched Gunnar Henderson get hit pretty high up. I mean, up by the shoulder blades. And, you know, Gunnar walked, you know, thank goodness, right? Gunnar was a little bit level-headed there. Walked down to first base, took it, you know, walked away. But makes you wonder, right? Because Gunnar Henderson's having a fantastic season. He's playing fantastic. So is Aaron Judge. So we watched the Orioles hit Aaron Judge. Now all of a sudden, Gunnar Henderson takes one up in the shoulder blades pretty high. It, I mean, it was pretty high, pretty inside. Like, if if they would have had Guccione and uh, Ryan Addison there umping that game, they probably would have tossed whoever was on the mound for that because we watched them do it with Freddie, right? Guy hit a home run against him. He plunked him. They threw him out without a warning. They had thrown him out. They had thrown him out in that moment. But nothing, nothing comes out of that. It's more or less just a, a little bit of a heated rivalry starting out there right now. And we see this. I mean, we've seen it before, right? Guys, you know, one guy gets hit, so they take exception. The next night, they're like, hey, I'm plunking this guy. I'm plunking that guy. You just hope, I mean, in all honesty, you just hope that it doesn't lead to a major injury. Somebody somebody taking a pitch, let's just say, off the head, right? Where, you know, a pitch gets away, but it really gets away, right? 
and it's a war. It's meant to be a warning shot, but it ends up hitting its target. Or a guy takes one off the hand, right? Or something that leads to an injury that's going to have him out for a while. That's where it's like, man, you know, I get it. I get why. You know, it's not like we don't understand why guys come after other guys. We get it. We understand it. We Sometimes you know it's coming, right? But a rivalry is being born. Between those two teams, a heated rivalry. I mean, if one more guy gets hit, I guarantee you there's going to be some benches clearing and it's going to get, it's going to get nasty. It's going to get nasty in there. So hopefully, you know, things start to simmer down between those two teams, but I don't see it. I don't see it. I see that rivalry is just starting. The heated rivalry is just starting there and I could see some bad stuff. I, I could see some bad news coming out of them about a, a benches clearing brawl or something like that happening pretty darn soon here. So, I mean, sticking with baseball, sticking with the MLB, sticking with the NL Central, and we got our 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 lovely neighbors down to the south there. We got the Chicago Cubs, right? And the Cubbies, well, the Cubbies are having their own way right now. They are, I mean, starting to slide a little bit down to the bottom of the division there. I mean, they. Seems like they're looking up and they're going, how the heck are we going to get back into this thing? Now, as I speak, now they are currently second to last in the division right now. They are ahead of the Cincinnati Reds by a half a game, but eight games back, right? And this team has struggled. They're 5-5 five and five in their last 10 games. One, two in a row now, but 5-5 five and five in their last 10 games. They are 36-39. and 39. So a little bit of a struggle, right? And we watched the other night there. Hector Neris did end up blowing a save for the for the Cubs there. Ended up blowing a save to the Giants. And a lot of Cub fans were upset. They were like, man, oh man, we got to get Hector Neris out of there. We need a different closer in there. This ain't working. We had the lead going. I believe it was 6-4 to four heading into the ninth there. And Neris ended up giving three runs. And that was the difference in that one. So, I mean, okay, so you got that backstory now. Now we look at Cub fans in general. And they're starting to not love Craig Council, right? When he came down there, the big it was the biggest, like, F you to Brewer fans, right? Cub fans were like, oh, he came to a winning team. Ah, you know, he didn't. He didn't want to. He didn't want to be up there with the losers. Now he's got management that's going to spend money. They're going to get him, guys. He's going to win World Series. All we needed was this great manager, and it's going to put us over the top. And da 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 da. And I loved it. I loved every second of it because I was like, okay, you know, I get, yeah, I I feel you, right? You got this manager who you've watched in Milwaukee do good things with less, and now you're all excited, and. Now, well, Cub fans, they want him out. They're done with him. They they look at him and they say, this guy can't do it. He can't manage. Take, send him back to Milwaukee. Will you guys take him back? We'll trade managers with you. Blah, 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 right? Seen it all. Seen it all now. And it just makes me laugh. It, it really does. It just makes me laugh because, I mean, to go from... One second, you're basically sticking your finger in our noses and telling us, like, ha ha, we took your manager. And the next minute, you're like, ah, we really, you know, we really don't want him. If you guys want him back, you can have him. Like, we don't, we don't really, we don't want this guy. Right? He ain't cut out for us. You know, he's, he's not as good as what we thought. And, you know, we, we're kind of, we kind of screwed ourselves. I find it comical. I really do. It's just Cub fans, to be honest with you. It's Cub fans. That's just the way that they are. Because, I mean, honestly, Craig Council's, you know, what he what he did and leaving Milwaukee the way that he did and going to Chicago, now that was a real kick to the nards. I'm not going to say that that didn't sting a little bit, that that didn't be like, mm, you know, there was more opportunity. You just, you went to Chicago. That's like Matt LaFleur coming in tomorrow and saying, 
I feel like I want to be done and I'm going to go coach the Minnesota Vikings, right? Are we going to like Matt LaFleur? Probably not. Probably not, right? But some people are like, ah, let it go. Let it go. Okay. I get it. I get it. You just want to move on. We got Pat Murphy now. It's going good. We just want to get, you know, let it go. But to get it there, I mean, Craig Council was not a terrible manager. Did I agree with the way that he did things sometimes? No. And that's not me being this armchair coach or anything like that. That's just me saying I don't fully agree at times with the way Craig Council managed things. But he found ways to get it done. Now he goes to Chicago, isn't finding ways to get things done, and now we see the Cub fans starting to, I don't want this guy. We we imagined in our heads instant success, and it ain't happening. So maybe we can just, I don't know, move on. You know, get him out of here. Get him out of here. I just find it, you know, quite, it, it is funny. It is funny in its own way that Cub fans are so quick to, ah, we're done with this guy. You know, we we were so excited. We were rubbing it in everybody's faces. Now we're like, eh, let's get rid of him. I mean, I, I loved it. I loved it. I love seeing it. I love seeing all the comments out of that right now. So great stuff there. Great stuff in a little bit of Cub news there. A little bit of Cub news there at the start of the episode here. So with that, I mean, jumping ship here, looking over at the NBA, looking at the Bucks. okay? We got the NBA draft coming up here pretty soon, okay? I want to get into some of the guys that I see the Bucks could potentially be looking at, but that's going to be, uh, maybe we'll get to that tomorrow. We'll get to that tomorrow here on the show, possibly. We'll get to that, uh, we'll get to that scenarios and everything like that with the Bucks. But in Bucks news, coming out of today, the apparently, it is reported that the that Giannis was big on getting Darvin Ham back to Milwaukee. But Giannis was advocating. He's like, I, you know, he's very vocal in it. We need this guy. We want him back. We need him in the assistant room to, you know, help us out, help out Doc, whatever it is. Now that's fine and dandy, right? Because Darvin Ham was here. We won the finals. He ended up going elsewhere, and now he's back, right? But is it something more? Is is Giannis looking at this from a different scenario, right? So Giannis wanted him back. Giannis has a lot of say inside the Bucks organization. And I mean, it, some people would say rightfully so, right? He's your superstar. He is the man. He's the guy on this team. So we listen to what he has to say, right? Keep mapping. I, sometimes I don't agree that it should be that way, but that's just the way it works. That's just the way it works. So, when Giannis said that he really wanted Darvin Ham, my initial reaction was, yeah, I mean, I'd want him too. You know, good X's and O's guy. I don't think he was as bad as what the Lakers put him out to be. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I think there's a deeper, deeper thing here. And I think it has to do with Giannis doesn't know if Doc's going to be that guy for the box. He doesn't know if Doc's going to be the answer. So he brings in Darvin Ham, gets him in there with Doc, and when push comes to shove, if Doc ain't working, here's Darvin Ham. He's already in the system. He already has worked with the players. They don't lose a beat. We instantly put him in. He now gets promoted head coach. Instead of having that interim head coach, we go look for another guy, instantly in there. I think Giannis is just looking at it like, Doc ain't going to be doing this. For that long, we can find, if we can find an assistant coach that can automatically fill in, skip the grace period like we had the last time with Doc, this guy can just fill in and jump in and be that guy. That's Darvin Ham. So I really do believe, when I look at it, that Giannis is thinking a step ahead and he's going, well, if we get him in there, maybe at some point we can utilize him as a head coach and that's going to help us there. That's that's one of the ways that I can see this working out because it, you know, Darvin Ham had to have options elsewhere, right? There had to be other teams calling. I mean, the Pistons just fired their head coach after a year, right? There's going to be options out there and he's going to be able to find a place to work, right? A place to coach, right? I don't think the books completely 
written and closed on Darvin Ham. I believe teams still think he has potential. So for him to jump on as a assistant coach makes me believe it's almost like a grooming spot. We're grooming him up. You know, we're we're fluffing the hair before we throw him in there. We don't we don't want to just, you know, send the show chicken out there without fluffing the feathers first, right? So we're going to fluff the feathers up. I don't know. I don't know much about showing chickens, but that that would be my assumption would be you fluff the feathers a little bit there. Get them looking nice. Get them looking nice. You want those feathers to be just pristine on them there. So maybe that's why, right? We're trying to groom them, get them ready, throw them into the system, right? That could be it. That could be the number one reason. And, you know, maybe it's just a common sense thing. Maybe it is a common sense thing that, you know, people might have already seen this, foreseen this as the possibility. But that's just where I was thinking and what I was thinking when I saw the news, you know, or the at least the report that Giannis was big in on getting Darvin Ham into Milwaukee there. So Bucks, Darvin Ham, maybe at some point we see him as the head coach. For the Milwaukee Bucks could be definitely something interesting, something to see there with the Bucks there. So I, like I said, I want to get to the the draft, the big board, who I have on my big board, who I'm looking at, and who I'm thinking the Bucks could potentially get there at some point. But with that, before we get into the Brewers, I got some Brewer talk I want to get to today, a little bit of Packer talk to end it. But before we get there, I got to mention the great sponsors of the show here quick. First game day supply in on Alaska. Do you have a sports club or team? Are you looking for some sweet custom uniforms or apparel? Check out the awesome crew at Game Day Supply in on Alaska to help your team get the sweetest gear. Find them on Facebook at Game Day Supply or online at GameDaySupply.net. Also, they have some of those new smacking seeds. If you haven't seen them out there, I've seen a ton of videos on them. New smacking sunflower seeds down there at the store. You can order them online from the store there. It they are fantastic. They are fantastic, and I I haven't tried all the flavors. I am going to definitely give them all a whirl here because I've heard nothing but great things out of them there. Sport and Spine Clinic in Greenwood, Wisconsin. If you've been injured recently and you need some physical therapy, whether you were working, whether you were playing ball, whatever it was, and you need some physical therapy, stop in there and see Chad at Sport and Spine Clinic in Greenwood, Wisconsin. He will get you right. He'll get you back to work, back on the field, whatever it was you got injured doing. He'll get you back there and feeling better than ever. Sport and Spine Clinic in Greenwood, Wisconsin. Sports scenes, sports cards, and memorabilia located in the Marshfield Mall in Marshfield, Wisconsin. You got to get down there and see Al. He has everything you need from sporting cards, to memorabilia, jerseys, model stock cars. He's got it all. Sports scene in Marshfield. Marshfield Motor Speedways located just three miles outside of Marshfield on County Road H. You got to get down there this summer. Tons of family fun for all ages. Great food, great drinks, great atmosphere. Nothing better for a fantastic summer day or night down at the track there. So Marshfield Motor Speedways. Pittsville Farm and Home Center. At the store, they serve you anything from hydraulic hoses to red roses. Stop in and see the awesome crew at Pittsville Farm and Home Center in Pittsville, Wisconsin. And also, your hometown team, Century 21 Gold Key Realty. Call Peggy Sewer Anna to find your dream home or if you're looking to sell. Find them on Facebook at your hometown team, Century 21 Gold Key Realty. Or stop in and see them at their location in Marshfield. But with that... Before we get to the Brewers, I got a list. I got a list that I saw today that was made up by Clutch Points. They're called Clutch Points. I don't know if they're on Twitter or wherever. I don't know. I just saw the list. And they listed their most hated NBA players of all time. I thought this was an interesting list, so I had to dive in there. I had to see what I was most hated NBA players, right? So who would you have on the list? Who would you leave off? The top 10. Most hated players of all time. Number one, LeBron James. LeBron James. I could see it. I could see it. I'm right there. I'm right there with you. I could definitely see that happening there. Kevin Durant comes in at number two. This could have a lot to do with Kevin Durant seems to jump on super team, super team. He doesn't want to build nothing. He doesn't want to work for it. He gets on super team. Look at the Suns, right? Look at the Suns team. Bradley Beal, Devin Booker, they're trying to build a super team. Look up at the Nets. He had 
the likes of Kyrie and James Harden on that team. Did it work? No. Is the Suns thing working? No. And he was with the Warriors at one point. Joined Steph, Clay, Draymond. I mean, the team was loaded. He didn't have to do he, – he, I mean, I'm not saying that in his stops he did not put up buckets and didn't play well, but joining super teams. That team was loaded. He just joined up, won a championship, right? Before that, OKC, that's when he was working a little bit. Right, he was working a little bit, trying to make things happen. Outside of that, he has just been jumping around super team to super team, trying to you know build something, and that could be why Kevin Durant is up there at the D two spot. Bill Lambeer is at the three spot. I didn't know that many people hated Bill Lambeer, but I guess so. I guess I mean I dislike a lot of people that I probably shouldn't. So <laughs> Bill Lambeer is at the three spot. Vince Carter. I love Vince Carter. I don't know what these people hate him so much for, but he's in the four spot there, most hated all time. So that one's kind of surprising. I love Vince Carter. Watching him play was just fantastic. I, I always I always found it fantastic watching him play, so I definitely thought that was an interesting one there. Isaiah Thomas. Isaiah Thomas comes in in the five spot. And I'm assuming that this is the Isaiah Thomas that played with the Pistons. I don't think it's the little guy who played with the Celtics a little bit there. I'm thinking it is the one with the Pistons there. Bruce Bowen comes in in the sixth spot. Latrell Sprewell comes in in the seventh spot. Chris Paul comes in in the eighth spot there. That one, I didn't really know Chris Paul ever did that much. Maybe that's why people hate him. I don't know. But I didn't know Chris Paul did enough to be hated. So Chris Paul in the eighth spot there. James Harden in the nine, I could move him up on the list, right? Because he just irritates me. He irritates me. The holding out, the, you know, have to be on this team, have to be on this team. I won't play if I'm on this team. The stupidity off the court. I mean, James Harden drives me nuts. Drives me nuts. I could see him being higher on that list. And Reggie Miller was just, uh, he was a good player. Probably could have been better if he didn't get hurt, right? Probably could have been better. But Reggie Miller was just, I mean, I wouldn't say that he was, that well some people i guess he's hated i never hated him that much i know i i watched him play a little bit watching his game i didn't it's not like i hated the guy you know maybe he did some stuff in between the lines that people didn't like but so i mean the list is interesting the list is definitely interesting there i don't know some of the guys on there if i would have them on there i mean most hated it's a rough word. It's a rough world. A rough, yeah, it's a rough world. Rough, rough list. Rough world. I mean, tough to, tough to uh, really look at it and try to see. But I mean that, yeah. There's a couple names on that list. So Le- LeBron really sparks me. He drives me nuts. So I'd probably have him up in my one spot there. The Vince Carter one, I'm not a fan of. I, I, I never really hated Vince that much. I mean, some fans out there might have hated Vince, but. I, I just don't hate Vince that much. So, I mean, to be up in that four spot, that's kind of surprising. That's I'm surprised that all the LeBron fans didn't come on there and say that they hated Jordan because that would not have surprised me. They would have said, yeah, I, I hated that Michael Jordan guy. He might have been the greatest of all time, and he might have been a, a phenom, and, I mean, just a crazy athlete, but we just hated that guy for some reason, right? I mean, definitely... Definitely an interesting list there. I, I just found it before. I, I had to shoot it out there. I had to, you know, and like I said, you guys have a different opinion. Definitely feel free to send a message to us there. Go in the bio and send us a message and let us know. Let us know on the show here who are your most hated NBA players of all time there. So with that, it's time. It's time we get to a little bit more. I just saw this pop up across my web feed there. So we got to get to a little bit more WNBA news. And eh, not really. WNBA, men's, a little bit of everything put together. So if you had to guess out there, the most watched basketball games of 2024 as of right now, what was your most watched game of 2024? The number one game. Give you a second. Give you a second to really think about it. Iowa. South Carolina. There was 18.9 million viewers. Then we go to, I believe this was the final four game. 
between NC State and Duke. If that wasn't the Final Four, that was game before that. It might have been. It might have been Elite Eight. I believe it might have been the Elite Eight that we saw Duke and NC State. Yeah, it was not Final Four. Duke and NC State, Elite Eight. That is the number two. And a lot of it was for DJ Burns. A lot of people want to watch Burns. But 15 million viewers there. That was 1 million more viewers than what tuned in to watch the Purdue and UConn National Championship. But the number four women's game there, or number four was a woman's game, Iowa and UConn, 14.4 million, uh, million viewers. The men's Alabama and UConn, 14.2. Then we get to finally, finally, the one who brings all the viewers to the TV, Angel Reese. She got in this one, 12.3 million viewers there in the number six spot, Iowa and LSU. Good stuff. Good stuff. You know what's baffling to me is I hear all this about Angel Reese telling us that she, you know, everybody was tuning in to watch them. It wasn't just Galen Clark. They were tuning in to watch them too. Explain to me then why in this list, in that top six, right? Because in that top, outside of the top six, the seven, eight, nine, ten, three of those were NBA finals games. And the other one was the men's uh, final four game between Purdue and NC state. So, Looking at the list, explain to me how the LSU Tigers did not end up on that list then. Did not end up on that list against, I don't know, you could have even said, well, when LSU played earlier games, why were they not on the list? Kaitlin Clark got in there in a Final Four game and a National Championship game. She had two games, three games in there. Three games in there. Elite Eight, Final Four, National Championship. She was in every single one of them and drew a crowd. Drew the sixth top six in most viewers in basketball. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. That's baffling. I wonder why, right? So I just saw that list. I just saw that list, and it was definitely interesting because, I mean, you look at the three games in the NBA Finals, Game 2, Game 5, and Game 3, that was 7, 8, and 9, or 7, 8, and 10 on the list there. The final four game between Purdue and NC State came in in that nine spot there. Definitely an interesting list. I mean, the women's game definitely showing out on that list there. You had three of them in the top six there. Some good basketball. Caitlin Clark's involved, right? Good basketball. Cordoso is involved from South Carolina there. I mean, definitely draws a crowd. Definitely draws a crowd there. Getting them all riled up there. So with that, finally, finally, we made it to the Brewers. We made it to the Brewers here, and we did see Christian Yelich got a beer bath after his after his uh, 200th home run yesterday. So good stuff there. That's the that's the only Wisconsin way to do it is a beer bath. You know, it would have been. I mean, if you would have gave him a Gatorade bath, whatever. Gatorade baths are normal. It had to be something crazy. And it was. It was a beer bath. And that's that's about as Wisconsin as if they were throwing bratwurst at him, it would have been about as Wisconsin as it gets. Hoo ha, right? So we see Christian Yelich get the bath there. Good stuff. But in injury news for the Brewers, Jacob Junis is set to rejoin the club in San Diego. When the Brewers are taking on the Padres, that'll be this weekend here. So we're going to see Jacob Junis rejoin the team. We're not sure his role yet. So we're not sure yet. Is he going to be in the bullpen as a long relief guy? Is he going to join the starting rotation? We're not sure where he's going to fit in the Brewers pitching staff. So. Definitely something to keep an eye on there. Maybe they ease them back into it, right? Maybe they ease them in. They put them into the bullpen for a little bit, see how long they can stretch them out in games, and then possibly put them back in the rotation. But good news there, Jacob Junis on the way back. Bad news, it looks like Robert Gasser, his third opinion supported the second opinion that elbow surgery is likely needed at some point, whether he does that now or he first tries rehab, he's definitely looking trending towards elbow surgery there. So not good news on Robert Gasser's front there, but 
Garrett Mitchell has been lighting it up at the AAA level for Nashville. Two home runs yesterday's game. Fantastic to see Garrett Mitchell starting to get hold of the ball. Will we see Garrett Mitchell back up with the big league club soon? I don't know. I don't. Truth, truthfully, I've thought about it. I've tried to. I mean, I've been. You sit there and you ponder it, and you're like, okay, who would if I if I were the Brewers, who would I send down? Right. The Brewers did already send down Oliver Dunn. We saw Tyler Black. He was recalled back to the Brewers. We saw Oliver Dunn get sent down. We saw Brad, uh, Bradley Black come back up from Double A. We saw Hernandez get designated for assignment. So those were some of the uh, the moves the Brewers made yesterday there prior to the game. But if you're the Brewers, how do you open up a spot for Garrett Mitchell? Because okay, now you you send down Oliver Dunn. Okay, that's fine. That's fine and dandy. But even if, okay, now you bring Mitchell up and you send down a guy like Andrew Monasterio. Okay, so now you have Mitchell up. You have a guy like Sal Frelick to back up third base. Where does Mitchell slot in then? Because you have Yelich, right? Yelich is out in the outfield if he doesn't DH, right? But then in that outfield, you have Jackson Churro and Blake Perkins already slated in there. And then you have Sal Frelick who's also sitting there. Who do you give the nod to? Who do you give the nod to say, you're going to be my outfielder, right? Churro right now has been hitting the baseball. He's been hot as of late. So can you realistically say, Jackson Churro, we're going to take you out of the starting lineup. We're going to use you predominantly as a uh, bench guy, and we'll see how it goes from there. Can you do that with a guy like Jackson Sherrill right now? I I don't think so. I mean, you're talking about a guy who's hitting 273 over his last seven, and in his last 15 games, he's hitting 286. I don't feel like you can move Jackson Sherrill right now, but if there's one guy I believe that you could potentially move, that would be Blake Perkins. Blake Perkins... Though he has had some streaks, and I mean, he's a fantastic outfielder, and I hate to say it, but you look at hitting 143 over the last seven games and 255 over the last 15, if you were going to give a guy some time off, it would be Perkins, right? Frelick has been hitting the baseball better. I just don't see, I don't see a scenario where you bring him up and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to see him just ride the pine. Right, because you want to give guys like that a consistent bat, right? A consistent at bat. So what do you do? What do you do from there? Because I don't see them sending Sal down. I don't see them sending Frelick down. I don't see them sending Churro down. I at one point I would have said yes. Now he's hitting the baseball, so it makes it harder there. Blake Perkins has played fantastic. The bats the bat's hot or cold for Blake Perkins, but the glove is phenomenal. And that's not to say that Garrett Mitchell doesn't bring you a dynamic of a fantastic glove in the outfield, because he does. Garrett Mitchell's got the wheels, he's got the glove, he's got the range. The guy is a great outfielder, too. I mean, we've been talking about Sal Frelick, we've been talking about Perkins. Garrett Mitchell's a great outfielder, too. Right? From what we've seen out of Garrett in the past, and on his way up, and everything like that, he is a fantastic outfielder in his own right. So, could we see Garrett Mitchell get out there and Maybe we maybe we play matchup by day, you know, see who hits, who doesn't. It's tough. If Garrett Mitchell continues to hit at the triple A level, I just don't know how you say to him or how do you say to yourself, yeah, we're gonna leave him down. Right? We're gonna leave this guy down. I I don't think he's going to, you know, be able to come up and produce for us right away. And we already have our outfields full. We're just not gonna bring him up. Because this guy's hitting out at AAA level. I don't see a way that you don't bring him up. But what do you do with him? Do you have one of these guys riding pine every day or every other day, right? I mean, if face a righty, you could go with an outfield of Perkins, uh, Sal, and Garrett Mitchell. And then if facing a lefty, maybe Churro gets in there then, right? I could see it working like that. I just feel like Garrett Mitchell, if he continues his torrid pace, 
down there at the down at the AAA level, I just feel like it's going to be hard to leave him down there. I just feel like the Brewers have got to make move for him at some point there, and maybe sooner rather than later. I mean, right now he's hitting 227 down there at the AAA level. He was one for five in the game last night there. He's hitting the baseball, and he's not striking out while he's doing that. That's a guy you want at the big league level, right, especially with his speed. Going to be definitely interesting in the coming days to see what the Brewers do and if they make a move for Garrett Mitchell there. But with that, Brewers make some moves. We don't know what's going to happen with Mitchell there, but the Brewers currently, as I'm watching, they got a 2 nothing lead against the Angels. Never know. You never know with the Brewers what they're going to do. We thought they were going to pull off a fantastic a fantastic 6-0 win against the Angels, let it get to 6-3, to and then Sal Frelick had to play hero ball and rob a home run to keep it at that score. But hopefully the Brewers hold on to this one. So Brewers end the series with the Angels. That was, I mean, a test for this Brewers team. Now they got the Padres coming up there. Should be a good series against the San Diego Padres coming up here. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that's a four-game series. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. A little four-game set against the San Diego Padres. 840 starts for the first two, and then 615, and then 310 for the last one there. We'll get into the weekend preview for the Brewers there. Recap the Angels game tomorrow, and then get into the weekend preview there with the Padres and everything like that on the weekend preview show coming up tomorrow there. But in a little bit of Packers news, to wrap it up here, a little bit of Packers news, we saw the Packers narrowed down their kickers to two of them now. They released Polinski as of yesterday, and that leaves Carlson and Joseph on the roster yet, eyeing up that kicking job for the Packers there. So definitely going to be some interesting stuff there. I'm hoping tomorrow, if all works out, tonight he had a little bit of car trouble, but tomorrow I'm hoping that we can have Aaron back on the show from Bruliana Sports. We're going to start doing a little bit of a brutally honest Wisconsin sports on the go crossover show every week for you guys. So we know we talk mainly Wisconsin sports throughout the week. This is going to let us spread our wings. We're going to get out there a little bit. We're going to talk national wide sports. We're going to talk still Wisconsin sports, right? And we're going to talk a little bit of his hometown, Philly, and a little bit of Orioles. So we're going to bounce all the way around there on those episodes there. So hopefully starting up tomorrow and then hopefully, you know, the weeks after we're going to keep dueling them out there and we're going to get some Wisconsin sports on the go. Brutally honest crossover shows to you guys should be fantastic stuff there. So with that, that's about all I got for today. I mean, if you guys love it, I love having you guys here, hearing me, you know, hopefully you guys agree with what I'm saying. If you don't, that's okay too. You got to sometimes disagree when it comes to sports, but I want to thank you guys for listening and tuning along and hopefully staying around. Remember remember to leave a review, leave a leave a comment, a review on wherever you're listening to the show, rate the show, whatever you got there. Go into the bio the on this episode or any episode before that. Go up at the top. You should see a link there. It should be a little uh, green emblem or whatever color it shows up it says send us a message click that send us a message let us know how we're doing if you have any questions that you would love us to answer on the show anything like that or any tips or anything like that that you want to give us anything that you think we could do to improve here but definitely like comment everything like that on the podcast platforms that you're listening on also make sure to give us a follow on uh, facebook wisconsin sports on the go with trade Instagram, Twitter, with sports on the go. You can find us there and definitely we'll be throwing content out all the time there. So with that, this has been Wisconsin Sports on the Go with Trage. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your Thursday. But until I talk to you guys again tomorrow, deuces. <laughs>
to the river, down to the river. 